Yes, break off, if I may, for a moment to make an announcement, and I'll try not to become emotional or self-indulgent. This is going to be a little bit difficult. At the end of September, I'll be taking a break from daytime radio. Uh, in other words, stepping down from this program. At the beginning of this year, my friend and boss, Helen Thomas, head of Radio 2, said she wanted to do something different in the afternoons. Now, I've been doing this program for 24 years at Radio 2, and so how can I possibly complain? The support and creative freedom that I'm given is fantastic at Radio 2 and really I can't hog the slot forever so let's give somebody else a go uh, the great news is onwards and upwards I'm staying at the BBC and Radio 2 to do some very exciting brand new digital projects and develop I hope you don't mind if I say a few words about my friend Steve Wright who I can't believe has gone just can't believe it I, I had 20 years, the luckiest position of being the show before his. So whenever I went down to the office after my show or went off home, I could hear his show. Always the same, always different every day, but the same energy, the same kind of frantic love of everything, love of life, humour, laughter. God bless him. He, of course did two things amazing in British radio he joined radio one the second generation of radio one so Tony Blackburn was first on in 67 and then 1980 81 Steve arrived and he had this daytime show I was 15 it was extraordinary so if you don't if you weren't around at the time Steve in daytime on radio one was just a wonder you know he had this zoo radio format all these characters would call him Mr Angry and Always somebody who used to ring in and say, I'll call you on the cellulite, meaning the cellular, <laughs> saying the word skeleton instead of skeleton, all these in-jokes. And I think that was exhausting. I mean, I, I think the production team must have been extraordinary with that. The second big thing he did was come to Radio 2 in the 90s. Now, I won't say that the station was was near the knackers yard it wasn't it was it was still posting great figures but i remember because i was a political correspondent in the 90s that mps were starting to say why don't we have radio two what's the point what's it doing that's different and it was genuinely in danger and they'd had some bad management they had a, a policy a music policy that was known as Wurlitzer and zither which just meant you play the strangest music you can find to try and be distinctive that didn't work the listeners were going and we had this incredible controller called jim moyer who came in I wasn't at Radio 2 at the time, but he brought in Steve. And that was the sign that this was going to be more than just a lick of paint for the station. And I think it's fair to say that Steve in the 90s, not to take away of those amazing, from those amazing voices who, like Terry, like Ken Bruce, who were the continuum going right back. But Steve did reboot the radio station and gave it a, a new lease of life. So I joined in 2003. And uh, I would say Ken and Terry and Steve, this incredible trio of broadcasters in daytime who were so lovely to me. Um, I, you know, I first listened to Terry Wogan doing Radio 2, The Breakfast Show, when I was six. And then here he was and I joined Radio 2 when I was 37 and he's still doing it with a break in, in the middle for, for TV. So I was in awe and I was addicted to radio so much so that when I was on holiday age 15 in Cornwall, the Radio 1 roadshow came to Newquay Beach and I made sure I got to the front row to sit and watch and by the way the DJ on the stage Steve Wright so Ken Steve Terry this amazing trio was so lovely to the 37 year old me and so welcoming and Steve in particular I would say went out of his way to just be so encouraging and and you'll hear this a lot from from my generation of broadcasters and below that you know, I can think of a couple of people who didn't know Steve, and he rang them up and said, just to say, I think you're doing an absolutely brilliant show. And I think he, I'd, it's it, he's a very unusual person. Someone on the air today said to me, you know, he was exactly the same off the air as on the air. That's not true. He was on the air. He was the broadcasting Steve Wright, and it was a very, very consummate professional uh, exercise. Um, off the air, I think he was much shyer, um, much more authentic, in a way, just in, in terms of he would almost 
front load his humility and, and, and grace. He wasn't interested in showing off. He was just somebody who I think liked to have true friends. And I was in awe because I loved radio, because I knew it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're doing a concert and you're opening for the Bee Gees or Neil Diamond or whoever, <laughs> Paul Simon. In terms of radio, you're, you're right at the apex with Steve. But my goodness, he would never have accepted that description. I couldn't believe it today when I heard the news. I just couldn't. I was, um, I just felt an incredible sense of loss. And the manager who told me, told me in the studio that he used for 18, 19 years in Wogan House. Wogan House is being gutted now and we're moving to the main broadcasting house and that's, that's life. But it's all come at the same time. So the studio that Steve used for close on two decades has been hollowed out the last week. So he can go in it and there's carpet and a desk. His cart machines have gone, his computer wall, his CD players, he still played CDs, probably still played vinyl occasionally. So it's all been taken out as part of the move. And the fact that it's gone and then Steve has gone too, just feels like an enormous hole in the, in the middle of Radio 2. I know that we'll be on air today and tomorrow and the day after, but we'll always remember Steve. We'll always remember the, the incredible professionalism of the man and the way that he would, you know, you turn on your radio and that's your friend. That's somebody you've had in your house for years and years and years. It's like when Wogan was asked, how many, how many listeners do you have now, Terry? Is it, is it eight million now or is it nine million? He said, no, it's, no, it's, it's only one. And with Steve, you knew you were the one. Rest in peace, my friend. You were a lovely, lovely, lovely man. And we'll miss you and we'll think of you every single day we turn on the microphone. Radio DJ Steve Wright has died age 69. I think he was one of the best radio DJs that this country has ever seen. Here are five reasons why. His unique style. Steve's quirky style for presenting radio set him apart from all the others. He effortlessly blended humour, wit and charm, which captivated listeners and made him instantly recognisable. Number two, his broad appeal. Wright's ability to engage with diverse audiences spanning different age groups and backgrounds contributed to his widespread popularity and long-lasting influence in the radio industry. Number three, his creative segments. He introduced innovative segments like factoids and non-stop oldies, keeping listeners entertained and coming back for more. Number four, musical knowledge. Steve Wright's musical knowledge was second to none, enabling him to curate eclectic playlists that appealed to a wide range of tastes, enhancing the listening experience for his audience. Number five, longevity and consistency. With a career spanning some four decades, Steve Wright consistently delivered high quality entertainment, building a loyal fan base and earning recognition as one of the best DJs of all time. Rest in peace, Steve Wright.